Welcome, uh, those who are watching online. Uh, we are on to lesson 13. Um, it's going to be a little bit different lesson because what we're, what we're looking at here in Revelation chapter 16 has a, a parallel earlier in the book where there are just many striking similarities, so we're going to look at both kind of simultaneously. Uh, but let's just start with this first verse of chapter 16. I heard a loud voice from the temple say to the seven angels, Go and pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. Um, the similar section is in chapter 8, starting with verse 6. The seven angels who had seven trumpets. So, seven angels again, but instead of seven bowls, uh, seven trumpets prepared to sound them. Can you think of other biblical examples of dreams or visions which mean the same thing um, but come in pairs that are slightly different? No. If I say Pharaoh, does that mean any bells? dream that Joseph interprets. Right? Pharaoh's dream of seven cows and remember what the other one was? Heads of grain. Seven heads of grain. Good. Um, you know, very, very similar. You know, two, two different visions that are very similar but slightly different and, and mean the same thing. Um, but also Joseph's dream of the you had the, the sheaves of grain bowing down to him. And then, remember the other one? The sun, moon, and the stars bowing down. And remember those that made his brothers so angry uh, because the correct interpretation is that his own brothers would, would bow down to him. Um, so, there is precedent for this type of thing. Let's dig into it. The left column is... The previous part of Revelation, the right column is what we're actually looking at right now. So first, we'll, we'll take this, you know, by parts. Here's a part that's similar in these two these two sections. Um, first, we'll look at the, the old one just as a reminder, review, and quick look at uh, review of the questions that we had asked about that and the answers we had come to, and then that'll help us understand what's going on here in this vision with the seven bowls. All right, so starting in Revelation chapter 8, verses 6 and 7, the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first sounded his trumpet, and hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown on the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. With this first trumpet, what, you know, we talked about this being, you know, false teaching. What, what effect of false teaching could the destruction of the trees and the grass symbolize? Do you remember what we said? Trees, grain, thinking of grass, grain, food, sustenance, what we need to live. False teaching can destroy the spiritual sustenance that we need to live. Okay, so then let's look at chapter 16, the first two verses. I heard a loud voice from the temple say to the seven angels, Go and pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and horrible and painful sores came on the people, who had the mark of the beast, and who worshipped his image. Similar or not so similar? What do you think? Do you see similarities? Well, when you think about burned up trees and grass, it leaves a scar or a mark, and that's like the sores are going to leave a mark or a scar. Good. I hadn't even, I hadn't even thought of that one. Yeah, they both... They both leave a mark, right? A scar on something living. This doesn't seem to be a super close 
parallel, right? Not, not super similar. Some of the ones we're going to look at are, are more similar um, than, than this. And, of course, you know, in Revelation chapter 8, we had not yet talked about the beast. So, the beast is not mentioned in Revelation 8, but by now we have talked about the two beasts, so that's why the beast is, is mentioned here. All right, let's move on. So the left column in chapter 8, uh, verses 8 and 9, the, Then the second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea became blood, a third of the creatures that live in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Keep going. I'm going to do the, the third angel as well. Then the third angel sounded his trumpet, and a huge star, blazing like, like a lamp, fell from the sky. It fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star was Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood. Many of the people died from these waters because they had been made bitter. What effect of false teaching could the turning of the sea into blood and the making of water bitter Symbolize what would the connection be between that and the effects that false teaching has? Well, Trish, water. We need water for life. Okay. So we need God's word for life. So if the water is tainted, just like that, if God's word is tainted, it won't sustain life. Good. Yeah. Yeah. The the, the water of life. Uh, becomes tainted, uh, it's no longer going to give us that, that spiritual strengthening that, that we need. It becomes something bitter, something something disgusting, something that causes spiritual death. You know, I mean, just one of you know top five themes in Revelation, the danger of false teaching is right up there. You know, number one theme, Jesus wins. Number two, because Jesus wins, we also win. I would say maybe number three, as far as what gets emphasized, would be how dangerous false teaching is. So, it's chapter 16. Is this, is this really about the same thing? Okay, so right column, verse 3. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea. Okay, there you go. There's a similarity, right? And it became blood. Again, similarity like that of a dead man. And every living creature in the sea died. Notice the difference in how many creatures died. What's, what's the difference? In chapter 8 it was a third. In chapter 16 it's everything. Okay, good. Significant? It's hard to imagine that's not significant, right? What would be, what would be the point? If the false teaching continues, then people will Good. Um, and remember, the, the, the kind of the immediate context we've been talking about is, you know, last week talked. This is the end, the very end, right? Well, those who those who are still clinging to false teaching at the end, they're all going to die, right? There is no, there's no, there's no more repentance after that. This is this is the end. Good. Um, and then verses four through seven. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they turned into blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, You are righteous, the one who is and who was the Holy One, because you have made these judgments. Because they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. And I heard the incense altar, this is a strange, this is a strange passage here. I heard the incense altar saying, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The, the incense altar speaking is kind of a, one of these without precedent things. I'm not quite sure what, what the point of that is. Um, for our purposes now, if you compare this to, to you know, what's on the left-hand side, not a super strong similarity um, other than the phrase, the springs of water. Right? You see the springs of water there um, in, in, in both of these. Uh, but in Revelation 8, you know, the emphasis here is on wormwood and the waters being bitter. 
here in chapter 16. It's, it's, it's continuing this emphasis on um, the water being turned into blood. Um, thoughts here. If this is also about the effects of false teaching, how do these verses in Revelation 16, so how do verses 4 through 7 help us understand the danger of false teaching? Same thing as pretty much I said before, like, um, there's no more water, so, and, and... You can't water, live off, you can't live off drinking blood. No, I mean, no. Yeah. Um, and they deserve it because they are the ones that are not God's chosen people. Good. All right, moving along, the left-hand column, starting with verse 12. Then the fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, as well as a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them became dark. And there was no light for a third of the day, and likewise for the night. Then I looked, and I heard a single eagle flying in the middle of the sky, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those whose home is on the earth because of the remaining trumpet blasts of the three angels who were about to sound of the trumpets. All right. What effect of false teaching could the removal of a third of the light symbolize? How could, how could we say, yeah, that's actually not talking about light, it's talking about the effect that false teaching has? Sure. Our faith, maybe? What, is, what does light have to do with it? It's kind of like, I don't know. The passage you've, I'm sure you've memorized at some point. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Good. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. God's word is a light showing us the way, right? If false teaching is added to it, what happens to that light? It's dimmed, right? A third of it is made, a third of it is made dark, you know? If it's not if there's still some truth left there, there's still some light, but uh, there's not as much light. And then we look at what Revelation 16 says. What's the parallel here? The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to burn people with fire. People were scorched by the fierce heat. Then they blasphemed the name of God, who had authority over these plagues. But they did not repent and give him praise. So, almost seems like the opposite, right? Rather than the sun being darkened, the sun is, is you know, allowed to burn people with fire. Um, but that is actually, it's not something that should surprise us at all. Um, this is probably, probably has its origins in Hebrew poetry. I think we talked about this before. You look at the Psalms and they don't rhyme, but they're poetry. What makes them poetry? Well, the defining characteristic of Hebrew poetry is parallelism. You say something and then you say it again. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. You're saying the same thing in slightly different words, okay? But also sometimes it's you say something and then you say the exact opposite. That's part of the the, 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 the poetry. And so that could kind of be what's going on here. It's that kind of idea. Um, we're going to make the same point, but with the opposite picture. But yet, since it's opposite, there is actually actually a bit of a similarity. You know, it's not something completely out of the blue. It's, it's the same idea, but flipped. Um, if they mean the same or similar thing, how could this picture of the sun being allowed to burn with fire, how could that be making the same point? What does false doctrine cause? Let me back up. What does fire cause? If you're exposed to fire, Annika, what does fire cause? Destruction. Destruction. Give me more. More than just one word. Don't look at mom. Look at me. Death. Death. Pain, right? Terrible, terrible pain. Good. What does false, how could we say that false doctrine does the same thing? You'll be in hell, terrible pain when you're in hell. 
Okay, good. Even here on this earth, you know, in this life, can we say that false doctrine causes pain? There you go. And Joel Osteen has nothing to, to, to offer you when you're not prosperous and wealthy, when you're sick and starving, he's got nothing for you. Good. And it hurts. And the fire, it spreads just like false teaching. Okay, good. That's that's a good good connection too. So for people at home, um, Steve Adamski mentioned, you know, the, the false teaching of the prosperity gospel, which so many TV preachers try to try to shove down your throat, which is basically Become a Christian and you'll get rich. They don't say it quite like that, but it's like that. But that false doctrine caused terrible pain because when problems come in your life, where's your comfort? You know, you're not rich, you're struggling. Well, that must mean you're not really a Christian. That must mean God doesn't really love you. Um, and then Annika pointed out this, this connection between how fire spreads, so does false doctrine. Very, very much, very much a very good um, parallel there. Yeah, or very bad. <laughs> Parallel. Um, questions on that? All right. On the left hand column, we are now in um, Revelation chapter 9 in the left hand column, the first 12 verses. Then the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen out of heaven to the earth, and the key to the pit of the abyss was given to him. He opened the pit of the abyss, and smoke came up out of the pit, like the smoke from a huge furnace. Uh, remember we talked about that, that being false teaching itself. So some, some false teaching has its origin in hell itself. You know, it's, it's actually Satan that's actually behind it. Um, verse 3, And out of the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given the kind of power that scorpions of the earth have. They were told not to harm the earth's grass, any green plant, or any tree, but only those people who do not have God's seal on their foreheads. Indeed, they were not given permission to kill these people, but only to torture them for five months. And the pain they cause is like the pain caused by a scorpion when it stings a person. In those days, people will seek death, but will certainly not find it. They will long to die, but death will escape them. The locusts look like horses ready for battle on their heads. What appeared to be crowns were like gold. Their faces looked like human faces. They had hair that looked like women's hair, and te their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates that appeared to be made of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of many chariots and horses charging into battle. They had tails with stingers like those of scorpions, and in their tails they had power to hurt people for five months. They had the angel of the abyss over them as their king. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. And in Greek, he has the name Apollyon, um, both meaning destroyer. One woe is past. Look, after these things, two more woes are coming. All right, now let's look at in the right column from Revelation 16. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. The beast's kingdom was darkened. People gnawed their tongues in their torment. They blasphemed the God of heaven. heaven because of their torments and their sores, but they did not repent of their deeds. These two are maybe not quite as similar as, as some of the others have been, have been fairly similar. The similarity, I would say, is in this. Um, who is affected in both of these? Unbelievers. Good. Okay, very good. It's only unbelievers. It's only the people of the beast that are that are suffering these consequences here. There are, you know, there are some things described in Revelation, some bad things that even believers will, will experience. But this is talking only about unbelievers or, or, or the people of the beast. Um, not a whole lot of similarity in the, the actual visual images here, you know, in the, in the symbolism. Um, the similarity is in who's getting affected, and then obviously that it's it's not a good thing if you're experiencing. Chris, is your hand going on? These bowls, they're like right before the end. Well, let's keep okay. let's keep going. That's a good question. What were you going to say? Well, it seems like it because these unbelievers still have time to repent. 
they still have time to repent? The said, but they did not repent of their deeds, which means they still could have repented of their deeds. Or is it saying, this is happening right because they didn't repent? It's the end now. They didn't repent. It seems like cause and effect. They, the, the God, it could be. They knew that something to get their attention and still... Still, they didn't. Nothing. They still. Well, yeah. Go ahead. The judge have that the sun and the air were darkened, and then the kingdom was darkened. Oh, you're right. You're right. I didn't notice that. Yeah. Um, in verse two, of the left hand column, the sun and the air were darkened, and on the right hand column, the beast kingdom was darkened. Good. Thank you. I had not noticed that. Yeah. My parents are here for this Bible study. Father, do you ever remember me telling you anything about the teacher we had in high school who taught us Revelation and the crazy things he said? Yeah, vaguely, yeah. Yeah, like this was, like these locusts, you know, these are, these are helicopters and tanks and, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on. What's that? Killer bees. Killer bees. <laughs> the murder hornets. Yeah. It's 2020. <laughs> Revelation's all about 2020. <laughs> all right. A, a longer section here. Left hand column, uh, verse 13. Then the sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice speak from the four horns of the gold incense altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel, the one with the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been prepared for this hour, day, month, and year were let loose so that they could kill a third of the people. The number of soldiers on horseback was 200 million. I heard their number. And this is what I saw in the vision of the horses and their riders. They had breastplates that were fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. The heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire and smoke and sulfur. As a result of these three plagues, the fire and the smoke and the sulfur that came out of their mouths, a third of, the, of mankind was killed. For the power of the horses is in their heads and in their tails, for their tails are like snakes that have heads, which they use to cause injuries. You haven't had any nightmares after these studies, have you? No, I was going to say, it sounds like a dragon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The rest of the people who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands by giving up their worship of demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, or wood, which cannot see, hear, or walk. And they did not repent of their murders, their sorceries, their sexual immoralities, or their thefts. So in the first woe, and I, I kind of drew some attention to this, where did the locusts come from? They came from the abyss, right? They came from hell itself. What about these mounted troops? Where are they coming from? Heaven. I don't think heaven. Mm -hmm. The great river Euphrates. They're bound at the river Euphrates, an actual river, you know, on earth. Mm -hmm. The point being that these are actually coming from, from the earth. So there are some false doctrines that seems like Satan himself created them. And there's others that are created by human beings here on, here on the earth. Um, so they have a, a human origin, whereas some have a demonic origin. If, if these are false doctrines, what would the significance be of the 200 million? A lot, right? Do um, you see any evidence in verse 19? That this is false teaching and not something physical? Yeah, um, their mouths or their. Good. Uh, the emphasis on the mouth, on the, on the head, that's where, where false doctrines um, come from. All right, now let's look at chapter 16 for the parallels. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates. Its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings coming from the east. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs, which came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, 
and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are, in fact, miracle-working, demonic spirits, which go out to the kings of the whole earth to bring them together for the battle on the great day of the Almighty God. Look, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes on, so that he does not walk around naked, and his shame is not seen. Then they brought them together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. You see any evidence in verse 13 that this is false teaching and not something physical? It's not the mouth idea again, right? See the similarity there? Um, in the New Testament, the picture of someone coming like a thief in the night is always associated with what? Jesus' second coming. Always associated with Jesus' second coming with, with Judgment Day. That is absolutely 100% consistent. So that's why we say the sixth bowl, this is, you know, this is the end. Um, come to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Um, Armageddon is a Hebrew word. That's like a, that's a transliteration, okay? Like if you were reading this, it's, it's, it's a Hebrew word that, that, that is pronounced Armageddon. But it never appears in the Old Testament. Um, what is it? Well, it might be a combination of the word, the Hebrew word har, which is mountain, and Megiddo, which is an actual place, an actual city, um, close to the famous Mount Carmel. Of course, you know, millennialists, you know, they run with this and they, they are convinced there will be an actual physical battle, you know, by the city of Megiddo. But there's maybe a more likely explanation of what, what, what's the point of this word? Why is there maybe an actual place mentioned here? Well, remember what famous thing happened on Mount Carmel in the Old Testament? There's a face-off. There's a battle, not a not. There's a showdown. Put it that way, a famous showdown between Elijah and the and the prophets of Baal. Good. And what was what was that battle over? What were they fighting about? Well, they're fighting about doctrine, right? It's a true prophet versus false prophets. Here's what the true prophet of the true God says. Here's what the, the false prophets of the false gods say, and there's a battle. So, it's just emphasizing the point. This is about false teaching and the danger of false teaching. It's not about locust tanks, you know, um, fighting a battle, you know, by, by the city of Megiddo in the Middle East. No, no. That, that word, that Armageddon, is, is just a clue. Think of your Old Testament history. What happened there? Oh yeah, it was a battle over teaching. It was a battle over doctrine. That's what the real battle is, is, is about. Um, anybody else notice any other similarities? All right. Let's do the seventh bowl. And wrap it up. Um, let's skip ahead a couple chapters um, in the you know in the earlier section here. We're now in chapter eleven to get to the seventh angel with the seventh trumpet. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, "The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever." The twenty-four elders who were sitting on their thrones before God also fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying. We thank you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your anger has come. And the time has come when the dead are to be judged. And when you will give the reward to your servants, the prophets, and to your saints, namely, to those who fear your name, the small and the great, and when you will destroy those who destroy the earth. And God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, crashes of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. 
Right hand column, chapter 16, the seventh bowl. The seventh angel poured out his bowl on the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, see the similarity there, right? Saying, it is done. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, and crashes of thunder. There was also a great earthquake of a kind that has not occurred since mankind has been on the earth. And the great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. So, on the left-hand side, talking about the nations being angry, and here, the cities of the nations collapsed. Babylon the Great was remembered by God, and he gave her the wine cup filled with his fierce wrath. Every island vanished, and the mountains could no longer be found. Massive hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell on people from the sky. And the people blasphemed God because of the plague of hail, because the plague was so severe. What do you think this is talking about? Any thoughts? Yeah. When in doubt, go with, go with that, right? Yeah. What did she say? Judgment day. But this, this is talking about, about the end. Um, let, let's look at some evidence for that. Only one other passage in Revelation mentions a severe earthquake. It's back in chapter 6, verse 12. And if you look at that section, clearly the context there is also about judgment day. So there is precedent for a great earthquake being associated with, with Judgment Day. Um, Babylon the Great was also mentioned in chapter 14. And if you remember what it, what it was, essentially it's all those who oppose the church. You know? and originally Babylon was you know, the enemy of, of Judea, and then for the, you know, the, 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 the people in the, the New Testament, the first century, uh, Babylon was, you know, like a symbol for Rome, the Roman Empire, and then for the reformers, you know, Babylon symbolizes the papacy, um, the Catholic Church. It's all of it. It's all of it. It's all of that and more. Babylon the Great is all those who oppose the church. And what is God going to do? Pour out his wine cup filled with his fierce wrath. This is the end. Um, justice will be will be met. So this has all been, both of these two visions, the seven, trump, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls, are mostly about the danger of false teaching. Why, I will make the argument and see if you can come up with some reasons why I'm correct. This warning is especially timely for the 21st century Christian church in the United States of America. Why is why do we need to hear this warning again and again and again about the danger of false teaching? Lauren? I think the false teaching nowadays is much more subtle. It isn't some beast, some mark, some whatever. It's very subtle undertones. I mean, you look at what they're doing in the church during the pandemic. You look at the way that Christians are treated on social media. I mean, there's a lot of things that are very subtle that are pretty profound. Yeah, in their own way, not a violent way, but in, in I think a new way. And the idea that all religions are the same, it doesn't really matter. It's just all the same. Yeah. Yeah, that that's a that's a you know, if you look back at false teachings, you say there's none that are new, like they're all just repackaged. This idea that all religions are the same, mm -hmm. that is kind of new, actually. That's not something that right. existed in the ancient world. I guess they kind of had their version of it, right? Like, this God is for this area. Our God is for our area, or our nation. And they can both both exist simultaneously. So that's kind of a version of it, but it's more insidious and more subtle. No, and, and that's, it's all the same. Yeah, and people say, well, I'm spiritual. That's, exa that's probably yeah. the perfect example of that, where I'm spiritual, because it's all, it's all kind of the same. And not only do they say I'm spiritual, but it's like they're offended by religious. I'm not religious. Ew, gross. Not yeah. religious. No, I'm spiritual. Yeah. Nope. Or they say they're religious, but they don't really practice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, other thoughts on why this warning is so needed today? Tell us why you're right. 
Well, my wife is good at telling me why I'm oh, okay. so this might be... <laughs> because all this stuff is leading up to the end, and we're obviously closer to the end now than... Ten were. people were hundreds of years ago. Yeah. yeah, that's true, that's true. We're even closer to the end now, I hadn't thought of that. I, I think biblical literacy is um, reaching a crisis point. Um, within within the church, among those who call themselves Christians, um, even in my, you know, I haven't, it's not like I've been a pastor for 50 years, but it seems to me like I've even noticed just in my time, people within our churches not knowing their Bibles as well as they did even 10 years ago. Carol? Didn't the Bible used to be the best-selling book? Yeah, what is it now? I don't know. I so hope it still know. is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the Bible and then Lord of the Rings was number two. Yeah, yeah. For a long, long time, it probably isn't anymore. I don't know. I was in Barnes and Noble this afternoon. The Bible section was pretty small. And I yeah. Yeah. The Hunger yeah, Games? Harry oh, Harry Potter. Yeah. Does yeah. anybody that, that any fall teaching, anybody can get it out on social media or the internet? Social, it's so easy to spread. And and you so you got you got thirteen times the poison than you maybe you had one in your area, and that's all that the church had to do was it was to preach against the false teaching that people were experiencing. Now you log on to the internet and you're in the midst of it. That is an excellent point. You know, social media is spreading all sorts of misinformation. Also applies to you know, religion and, and, and Christian doctrine. The how easy it is for a false doctrine to spread like that. Yeah, yeah. Now, it's also easy for true doctrine to spread, you know, that's, that's certainly a blessing, but yeah, I think there's a lot of reasons uh, to, be, to be very, very concerned. Yeah. Unfortunately, false true doctrine doesn't tell people what they want to hear. It tells them the truth. Yeah, so. which, which brings me to my, my next point. Kind of similar to every religion's the same. Well, also this like, this just denial of there being even being such a thing as the truth. You know, you can't you can't who knows what the truth is. You can't trust you know journalists. You can't trust the news. You can't trust you can't trust experts. You can't trust who are you? That book is thousands of years old. I can't trust that. That's like, there is no truth. Like that makes it so difficult for us to just. Tell people the truth. If people are in denial that there even is such a thing as truth. Yes. Well, we go a lot more with our feelings. Yeah. So what makes you feel good or what do you feel is right? That's definitely, yes. Reason, reason and evidence have been replaced with emotion. And, and Political feelings. correctness. Sure, yeah. Well, the only sin left is to offend someone. Subjective truth. As yeah. long as you've got yours, you and I can have different truths, and it doesn't seem to be, that's not illogical to anyone in this life. It, that's just, that's just confounds me, and I can't, I can't, I can't figure it out. It, it confounds me too, because people who say that are not consistent with that. It's not like, you know, they would still say, well, yes, pedophilia is always wrong. Well, if one person's truth is fine for them and another person's truth is fine for them, why are there some things that you still say, well, no, that's absolutely, that's absolutely wrong. Yeah, I mean, they're just not consistent at all with, yeah, I don't know. If, if part of the problem is do we forget teach, to teach people how to think? <laughs> the government wants to tell you how to think. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know about that. But Social media. Though, yeah. <laughs> well, but we have forgotten. There are many things not taught in school anymore. In most schools, I mean, we don't we don't we don't teach logic in terms of type thinking. They don't really teach civics like they used to, which they talked. There's been a lot of articles about that in terms of the election and the follow-on and what's going on and what people think is the right thing to do or not do after the election. And just there there are so few people have the concept of well, that we have this all written down in our constitution, and that people don't have any idea that that's what it is. They think there's just people flailing around in D.C. Waiting to figure out who's the next president. And well, we have someone here who spent his career teaching history and civics. Do you have any thoughts, Dan? Well, I, I had that same thought. If, the, if there was a science teacher in the room, we'd probably have an argument here. But I wonder if we haven't 
so much emphasize this new STEM program. Well, you do have an engineer sitting behind you, so be yeah, careful. Yeah, computer science. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I, I agree with you. emphasize basic government and civics so that people don't know their own constitution, they don't know their history, and it's, it's, I think that's part of why people are having trouble telling false from correct and right from wrong, and, and we're losing control of the language. Words have to mean something. Right. Marriage meant one thing throughout history, and now it means a union of two people of the same gender. Yeah. It's not good, it doesn't satisfy them to let them call it a civil union. No, it has to be called marriage. Mm -hmm. right. Gender is fluid also. Yes. Right. Yeah. Gender is fluid. You're speaking of that. But it can be changed. Have you, isn't this, I, I mentioned this to my family the other day, isn't it really interesting that at the same time we're saying there is no such thing as gender, simultaneously people are throwing lavish gender reveal parties. Right. Like yeah. those two things are popular at the same time, and it's probably some of them are the same people. It it just doesn't make any doesn't make any sense. I don't know. Yeah, maybe we need to go back more to our classical system of education, where logic and rhetoric are yeah. actually formally taught. <laughs> well, but you know, I mean, even in in biology, there is only male and female. I mean, you know, trust the science, right? Yeah, you know, the science yeah. tells you that there's. The, the whole chromosome thing, it kind of only goes one way. Yeah, yeah. Sure. But you wait. Leave it to the lawyers like that. <laughs> All sorts of vocations are, 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 are useful in a Bible study, right? <laughs> well, I'm actually not a grocery All right, let's close with the blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all.